Oh, that's new. <laughs> okay. Oh, what's that? Uh, uh, there's, there's a thing come up. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so I'll just click continue then now because it was just, <laughs> it was just strange. Eh? Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another CARS webinar. Tonight we have space news from Roy Bryce. Then our main speaker for this evening is Dr. Steve Barrett from Liverpool University, who will give two, talk, two 30 minute talks entitled Lighter Side of Astronomy and Ancient Light. Our next webinar is on the 14th of June, when it will be our AGM. If anyone has any relevant business for the agenda or wishes to stand for committee, please inform Robert McFetridge, the Society Secretary. The speaker for this meeting has yet to be confirmed. It will also be our last meeting of this session. Now it's over to Roy for the Space News. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'll just give me a second or two as usual just to bring the screen up. It's kicking off. Try again. Yeah. Uh, can you see the usual splash screen? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah. That's it. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> As you're probably aware by now, either I'm really keen on Martian news or there's an awful lot of really cool discoveries being made about Mars just now. From the point of view of the space news presentations, there's an abundance of missions actively producing data on Mars right now. So there's lots of current news to give you. Elon Musk keeps telling us that we'll be able to fly there whenever we want. But what are we going to do when we get there? By our standards, the surface of Mars is the picture of desolation. It's not only irradiated and cold enough to make Antarctica look balmy, but it's also a thousand times drier than the driest place on Earth. However, beneath the super arid surface of the red planet, there's abundant supplies of water ice that could someday be accessible to human explorers. This is especially the case in the mid-latitude region known as Arcadia Planitia, a smooth plain located in the Martian northern lowlands. According to new research conducted with support from NASA's JPL, the region shows signs of glaciers and glacier activity. These findings could prove very useful for future human landings and exploration on Mars. Speculation about the existence of ice on Mars goes back centuries, but it remained uncertain until NASA's Viking missions became the second and third missions to land on Mars in the 1970s. These noted the presence of atmospheric water vapour in glacier-like features, which included widespread ripples and accumulations of unconsolidated material, which we geologists call moraines. These features are commonly associated with glacial landscapes here on Earth. Since at that time it was not yet confirmed that Mars once had water on its surface, the scientific community cautiously referred to these features as viscous flow features. And since exposed water ice sublimates on Mars from the low air pressure and yeah. exposure to solar radiation, researchers conjectured that yeah. these glaciers... Janice, could you mute yourself, please? Oh, I thought it was muted. No. These glaciers oh. need to be protected by a thick layer of regolith. By 2002, sensor data obtained by the Mars Odyssey Orbiter confirmed the presence of subsurface water ice in the mid-latitude region of Mars. These findings were confirmed in 2008 by the Phoenix lander, which noted the presence of subsurface water ice in the northern Arctic plain. Then came the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which detected abundant subterranean water ice beneath the flat plains of Arcadia Planitia. The MRO's ground penetrating radar indicated that this ice extended from the surface under a layer of dust and debris downward to a depth of about 38 metres. Data provided by these and other missions have allowed scientists to map, catalogue and categorise thousands of features that are likely to be the result of glacier activity. 
for the sake of their study, Hibbard and her colleagues at NASA mapped out dozens of surface features in Arcadia Planitia, looking for these same kinds of sinuous features. In the process, they found ripples and furrows and valleys and on hillsides. I'm going to take just like somebody in. Uh, sorry. In the process, they found ripples and furrows and valleys and on hillsides, which are typical whenever ice flowed downhill. However, they also found these features in a flat line region of the plain that was isolated from any bluffs or slopes. This left only one possibility, which is that glaciers once flowed across these flat areas of the surface as well. In the case of Arcadia Planitia, the ice sheet has stopped flowing since and become a stagnant ice stream, accumulating a thick layer of surface debris. These unique characteristics present an important possibility for future crewed missions to Mars. In short, could this water ice be extracted for the sake of human consumption? After years of development, the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope project has been awarded half a million dollars to support additional work as it enters phase two of NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts program. I've spoken before about some of the other things that have been put forward for this program, they're all quite fun. While not yet a NASA mission, the LCRT describes a mission concept that could transform humanity's view of the cosmos. The LCRT's primary objective would be to measure the long wavelength radio waves generated by the cosmic dark ages, a period that lasted for a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, but before the first stars blinked into existence. Cosmologists know little about this period I think the answers to some of science's biggest mysteries might be locked up in the long wavelength radio emissions generated by the gas that would have filled the universe during that time. The early stage NASA concept could see robots hanging wire mesh in a crater on the moon's far side, creating a radio telescope to help probe the dawn of the universe. The magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune are really seriously messed up, and we don't know why. The magnetic fields of most planets, if they even have one, are pretty straightforward. The planet spins in a certain direction and the field roughly lines up with that direction of spin. Sometimes the fields might wander around a little bit here and there, but generally speaking, everything makes sense. And then there's the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. In the case of Uranus, the planet itself spins almost perpendicular to the rest of the solar system, but its magnetic field is in almost the usual up-down direction. With Neptune, the magnetic field is a full 47 degrees away from the spin direction. In addition, the magnetic fields are offset away from the centres of both planets. Scientists have long guessed that something strange is happening within the planets. Both planets are thought to host large convective layers, somewhere between the core and the atmosphere, where super-pressurised water and methane exist in a superionic state, with properties of both liquids and solids. The superionic water and methane circulate in up-down patterns, and since they're charged, the planets may well generate the magnetic fields there, rather than in the cores. To test this idea, Tsumaka Kimura Mokahito Murakami from the Department of Earth Sciences at Zurich University studied the properties of ammonia in a superpressurized state using a diamond cell anvil. By squeezing the sample and heating it to over 2000 degrees Celsius, they were able to recreate the interiors of the ice giants. They found that the superionic ammonia might indeed be stable at those pressures and temperatures, suggesting that it might exist inside the planets. But crucially, the ammonia wasn't viscous enough to form a stable layer deeper within the planet. In other words, for the convective layer idea to work, it needs to sit on top of a stable layer, and it seems difficult to get ammonia to play both roles. And without a convective layer, we can't explain the magnetic field structure. So for now, the mystery of the ice giant's magnetic fields remains unsolved. White dwarfs have some surprisingly strong magnetic fields, and one team of astronomers may have finally found the reason why. When they cool, they can activate a dynamo mechanism similar to what powers the Earth's magnetic field. Some white dwarfs have magnetic fields a million times stronger than the Earth. 
but the origins of these fields have been a mystery for astronomers ever since the discovery of the first magnetized white dwarf in the 1970s. The biggest problem is that white dwarfs have all sorts of different magnetic fields, and some don't have them at all. New research may provide an answer. Dynamo processes inside white dwarfs can power up some pretty impressive magnetic fields. Professor Boris Gansicki of the Department of Physics at the University of Warwick says, we've known for a long time that there was something missing in our understanding of magnetic fields in white dwarfs, as the statistics derived from the observations simply don't make sense. The idea that, at least in some of these stars, the field is generated by a dynamo can solve this paradox. Some of you may remember dynamos on bicycles. Turning a magnet produces an electric current. Here it works the other way around. The motion of material leads to electric currents, which in turn generates a magnetic field. To get a dynamo to work, you need a layer of convecting material. The churning, rotating material can take weak magnetic fields and fold them back on themselves, amplifying them. The main ingredient of the dynamo is a solid core surrounded by a convective mantle. In the case of the Earth, it's a solid iron core surrounded by convective liquid iron. <coughs> Excuse me. A similar situation occurs in white dwarfs when they've cooled sufficiently, explained Matthias Schreiber. When a white dwarf first forms, it's a hot, dense ball of liquid carbon and oxygen. As it begins to cool, some of the carbon and oxygen forms a crystal lattice. That crystallized core forms the foundation on which a convective layer can sit. If the white dwarf accretes material from a nearby companion, it can begin to spin rapidly, powering up the dynamo. As the velocities in the liquid can become much higher in white dwarfs than on Earth, the generated fields are potentially much stronger. Oops, sorry, somebody else joining in, just gonna let them in. Let me do that bit. As the velocities in the liquid can become much higher in wet dwarfs than on Earth, the generated fields are potentially much stronger. This dynamo mechanism can explain the occurrence rates of strongly magnetic white dwarfs in many different contexts, and especially those of white dwarfs in binary stars, Schreiber says. Dynamo mechanisms are common throughout the universe, and this work shows how these mechanisms may resolve this decades-long problem. The beauty of our idea is that the mechanism of magnetic field generation is the same as in planets. This research explains how magnetic fields are generated in white dwarfs and why these magnetic fields are much stronger than those on Earth. I think it's a good example of how an interdisciplinary team can solve problems that specialists in only one area would have difficulty with, Schreiber added. And now from white dwarfs to red giants. Scientists have succeeded in dating some of the oldest stars in our galaxy with unprecedented precision by combining data from the star's oscillations with information about their chemical composition. A team led by researchers at the University of Birmingham surveyed around 100 red giant stars and were able to determine that some of these were originally part of a satellite galaxy called Gaia Enceladus, which collided with the Milky Way early in its history. I think Lynn's been reading the same article as me because she's popped this in the newsletter for the society. Anyway, the results published in Nature Astronomy revealed that the group of stars surveyed all have similar ages or are slightly younger than the majority of the stars known to have started their lives within the Milky Way. This corroborates existing theories suggesting that the Milky Way had already started forming a significant fraction of its stars when the merger with the Gaia Enceladus galaxy occurred. By the time of the collision, the Milky Way was already efficiently forming stars, most of which now reside within its thick disk, one of the two disk-like structures that make up the galaxy. Asteroseismology is a relatively new technique, which measures the relative frequencies and amplitudes for the natural modes of oscillation of the stars. This enables scientists to assemble information about the star size and internal structure which enables accurate estimations of the star's age to be made. In this research, the team used information on the individual oscillation modes of each star 
rather than averaging the properties of their pulsations. They were also able to use astroseismology in combination with spectroscopy, which enables the chemical composition of the stars to be measured. And another one that Lynn may have already heard about. Understanding our world requires us to understand the effects of minor changes to our atmosphere that are caused by pollution, volcanoes, and outgassing cows. Although since the cows are natural, I'm not going to call that pollution, although opinions may well vary. We also have to look at sun and its behaviours. From 1645 to 1715, for instance, the sun went through a weird low period with very few sunspots and none of its normal every 11 year maxima occurring. This period of solar minima, called the Maunder Minimum, coincided with drops in temperature on Earth that dramatically affected harvest. We still don't know what happened, but the need to understand solar activity drives all sorts of research into the sun's magnetic field. In a new study appearing in Nature Astronomy and led by Marco Strangelini, astronomers used high resolution images of the solar atmosphere to study how magnetically driven waves called alphan waves carry energy through the sun's atmosphere. Remarkably, they found that waves low down in the atmosphere were able to send energy up through a column of material potentially even explaining why the sun's outermost layers are hotter than the lower layers. While these waves were predicted 50 years ago, it's only with today's high quality instruments and powerful computer models that we can finally study them in detail. And the still new Inoyu Solar Telescope has more and more time to capture data, we can expect more breakthroughs. While the sun's short-term fluctuations really affect our Earth at its surface, its periodic outbursts and changes in activity can wildly affect the Earth's outer atmosphere, both by generating amazing aurora and by causing the atmosphere to change in size over time. For low orbiting spacecraft, that change in size is a major issue, as even a couple of hundred kilometres up, the rare atmospheric particles still create a drag on spacecraft, and that drag will eventually bring those spacecraft down. Over the past 60 some odd years of launching things into space, researchers have come to notice that when the sun is more active, more stuff is observed to fall out of orbit. And in, gen in general, it takes more effort to keep things in orbit. This effect can have dramatic impacts on modeling, where and where space junk might fall to Earth, and has to be included in long and short term models for objects ranging from decades dead satellite to recently misplaced Chinese rockets. In a new paper, the Astrophysical Journal Supplement, a new software model is released that should allow solar radioactivity to be predicted on timescales of 1 to 24 months, depending on the type of activity. This software is called Resonance and should allow mission planners to better understand their fuel needs and how their dead missions would decay back to Earth. Now for something completely different, well, in the chat before the meeting, I was saying I've been going on YouTube every day to watch the Icelandic volcano live. But anyway, this is just a wee picture about it. The eruption at Fagradafsulfoli, volcano in southwestern Ireland, Iceland, sorry, has put on quite a show this year, lighting up the night sky and even appearing to influence the clouds above it. This natural colour satellite image shows the volcano by daytime with a rare clear view of the eruption and the geological features of the landscape. The operational land imager on Landsat 8 acquired this image around midday on May the 9th. Dark brown areas indicate where cooling lava has piled up and spread across valley floors. Notice the wee line of red lava that you can actually see pouring from one of the vent systems. A volcano activity update from the Icelandic Met Office on May the 12th noted that the vents associated with this eruption have spilled nearly 30 million cubic metres of lava since the start of the eruption in late March. Measurements on May the 10th indicated that the lava discharge rate was increasing, reaching 13 cubic metres per second. And this is actually, by my standards, quite an old post. It's 10 days old. The lava flow has increased considerably by then since now. And the bit down at the bottom, you can probably see there's a road curving along 
the bottom here that again we're talking about is the tourist route around Iceland and the lava is now threatening to flow over that road and taking out both the road and all the electronic communications cables that run along with it. So the Icelanders have been trying to build a wall uh, to stop the lava flow or at least divert it. You can't stop lava. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. So as always, many thanks to the folk at University Day and the Daily Space podcast for providing me the up-to-date information that I use for compiling this presentation. And back to Alice Amanda. Well, that was really, really interesting, eh? Thank you. Yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah. That um, volcano, that looks really spectacular, yeah, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully they, they can manage to, to build the wall quick enough to divert the lava yeah. so that it doesn't destroy the, their infrastructure. I haven't been in for three days, so I'm not sure what it is, but anyway. No. All right. Uh, Dr. Steve Barrett is a senior research fellow in the Department of Physics at the University of Liverpool. His research interests have centred around the applications of imaging and spectroscopy to fields such as nanoscience, geomaterials, biomedical imaging and infrared spectroscopy. He is an expert in image processing and image analysis and has written image analysis software that has been used by researchers throughout the world. His teaching to undergraduate students has covered many topics and included supervision of astrophysics students on astronomy field trips to the TID, um, TID, T, no, no, TID Observatory in Tenerife. His interest in astronomy predates his professional career as a physicist. He has given hundreds of astronomy related talks to astronomical societies, special interest groups and schools to an audience totaling over 10,000 people. As a result of giving these outreach talks, he was awarded the Sir Patrick Moore Prize in 2019 by the British Astronomical Association. So let's give um, Dr. Steve Barrett the usual warm cast welcome. Thank you very much. At the moment, I'm not allowed to optimize for video. Is that something that can be set by the host? If it's a problem, I'll um, just ignore that and move on. Let me just uh, check again. No, so the videos won't play particularly smoothly, but that's not that big a deal, I don't think. So let me just sort my camera out. and get rid of this annoying bar at the top. Okay. So good evening, everybody. And thank you for the invitation back to talk to Clydesdale AS once again. So this next half hour is just supposed to be a little bit of fun. The lighter side of astronomy, it's a few bits and pieces that I've picked up that just made me laugh or made me chuckle, and I hope you feel the same. So we're going to look at the lighter side of astronomers, telescopes, observatories, and probably that's about it for half an hour. I add a miscellaneous, but I don't think there'll be anything beyond observatories. So some astronomers are scientists. You probably are aware of that. And yes, that's pretty much what's going through my head all the time. So in answer to the question, do you think you have what it takes to be a scientist? In the words of Sir Patrick? Well, we just don't know. But of course, some astronomers are indeed scientists. Some astronomers are astrophysicists. And I assume everybody is sort of happy with the, with the physics that's on the blackboard there. We're gonna start from that 
sort of level and then work our way up a bit in the next half hour. But some people have said, well, if astronomers are scientists and astrophysicists, is there a way we could classify them? Because what astronomers spend some of their time doing is thinking about the classification of stars. And if you look at all the stars that are out there, you see that some are brighter than others, some have different colors. And the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which some of you might know about, are a way of cataloging all these stars and plotting them as a function on the x-axis, as a function of their temperature, low temperatures on the right, about 3000 Kelvin, higher temperatures on the left, 30, 50, 100,000 Kelvin perhaps. And the vertical scale is a measure of their luminosity how bright the star actually is, not how bright it appears, but how bright it actually is. And if you plot all the stars, you see that all the stars are not scattered evenly, they bunch into particular regions. So we have the very, uh, very hot white dwarfs down here. We have some cooler red giants and red supergiants on the right hand side, some very luminous stars at the top. And on this diagonal line, we have the main sequence. Fairly ordinary stars, for instance, like our sun, fairly average sort of stars. So if you can catalog or classify stars according to their color and according to their brightness, one person thought, well, could you do the same for astronomers? And they came up with the HR diagram of astronomers. And in this particular case, the vertical scale, luminosity, well, we can't measure the luminosity of a person, but if we think of luminosity as being fame, well, you can measure the fame of an individual by seeing how many hits you get when you do a Google search for that particular individual. So if we take an individual, Google their name, make sure we're dealing with the right person, and then see how many Google hits we get, we know where to put them on this vertical scale. And the horizontal scale, just like the color scale of the real HR diagram, the, the, the horizontal scale is backwards. And this is the number of scientific papers that the individual has published. Low numbers on the right starting from one and high numbers going to the left, as you can see, 10, 100, 1000 over on the left hand side of the diagram. And there are a few individuals that you might know. You're unlikely to know anybody in the bottom half of the HR diagram because by definition, they're not very famous. But if we think of the very top left, that individual there, virtually the highest you can get, the most famous and about as far left as you can get, having published the most scientific papers. So arguably it's the most famous, most scientifically prolific astronomer. I'll just give you a couple of seconds to think who might that be. I'm not expecting any hands up or anybody jumping in, but you might have guessed who that might be. And the answer is that is Carl Sagan, the most famous, most prolific scientist who declares himself as an astronomer. Right next door there, who is that? Slightly more famous perhaps, but almost as prolific as scientist. That's Stephen Hawking. If we come further over to the right, we're staying with the very famous people. If we come over to the less scientifically prolific individuals, but almost as famous, that's where we find Brian Cox, a media star, not quite in the same league in terms as a scientist as Hawking and Sagan. And for some reason, I don't quite understand, right over on the right-hand side of this diagram, an individual has been included who is almost as famous as those three people, but scientifically output, well, there isn't technically a zero when you're dealing with a log scale, so that star ought to be way over to the right. That's Mylene Class, not a scientist, but I guess she has introduced some programs. She's a TV presenter, amongst other things, and that's why she's on the diagram. You might notice a few under, other individuals you know, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Chris Lintott, um, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, for instance, scattered in that top third of the diagram. I thought this was quite interesting. But once I saw this, the first thing I thought, being a negatist, is, hmm, I wonder where I would be. Because in principle, I'm a scientist, therefore I produced scientific papers. And anybody can Google themselves and find out how many Google hits they get. So I thought, right, let's just see, just for the sake of argument, where would I be on that diagram? 
So I Googled myself, um, Steve Barrett is not good enough because there's too many Steve Barretts in the world. Dr. Steve Barrett isn't good enough either because there's a Dr. Steve Barrett in America who gets quite a few Google hits and I didn't want to steal his. So I ended up searching for Dr. Steve Barrett Liverpool to try and narrow it down to only me. Um, and then Google told me after a little bit more than a third of a second that there are approximately 5,000 hits. So I thought, right, okay, 5,000 hits on the vertical axis. I've published uh, a little more than 100 scientific papers. So where does that put me? That puts me there, right in the middle of the main sequence. So this tells me what I have actually known all along. I am a completely mediocre scientist. Fantastic. Okay, let's have a look at a few cartoons. This one I quite like. Two cavemen, one looking through the hollow log, saying, no, nope, moon looks the same. Is this the most powerful one you have? It's a nice cartoon. It's got a nice theme, but the reason I actually like this one is not because he's looking through a hollow log expecting the moon to be magnified. It's twofold that I like this. In the background, there is another telescope correction, there is another hollow log, but this hollow log, notice it has a little finder log strapped to it to make it easier to find objects in the night sky. You find them in the small hollow log and then you'll find them in the large hollow log. Nice idea. The other reason I like this cartoon is because clearly the caveman on the left is thinking of buying one of these telescopes, they have the price tags on them, but I like this because the caveman on the right is clearly the salesman. You can tell that from the hairstyle and you can tell that because this caveman is wearing a tie. Great, fantastic. Some ancient astronomical devices, such as a sundial, for instance. Here, the owner of a sundial is observing the fact that the sun is going into eclipse and then everything goes dark and the sun is fully eclipsed and then the sun reappears again, at which point he has to ring the sundial repairman or bring the sundial repairman in. Why? Because he explains, well, immediately after the eclipse, it just keeps blinking 12 o'clock. Another wonderful modern take on the old sundial. And of course, we all recognize this ancient astronomical device. Well, we're not too sure whether it's a clock or a calendar or a mix of the two. But here, one individual in the bottom right there is telling the other. One thing we have to remember with this, of course, is that at the end of summertime, we have to give everything a slight turn to the left. Yeah, they had summertime even in those days. It's a complete mystery as to how they move these blocks. Maybe we think we understand how Stonehenge was built in terms of moving these blocks around. Here, one individual is saying to the other, how did they move these massive stones? And again, Sir Patrick might say, well, we just don't but know. But the hint in this case, the clue that tells us how these large blocks were moved in ancient times is given by what is now appearing on the left-hand side. That's the hint that tells us how it was done. Let's have a look at a few astronomers, maybe not all of them. Let's just pick out two or maybe three and have a quick think. Galileo, not only an astronomer, but of course a physicist, well known for the fact that um, apocryphally, he uh, dropped cannonballs off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, a large one and a small one, and noticed that they hit the ground at the same time, whereas previous scientists or philosophers had said, no, the heavier one will clearly hit the ground first. And the question is, is that true or not? Galileo, rather than saying what should happen, decided to make measurements, dropping cannonballs and timing how long they took. Of course, you need some precise timing, Galileo didn't have much more than his own pulse to judge the timing of very closely spaced uh, things happening in time. And it's sometimes been asked, well, would things have been different if Galileo had had access to computers, would it have made a difference to the way Galileo did his experiments? Would they have ended up being more precise? But cynics have said, well, no, if computers were available in Galileo's time, he would have ended up throwing the computers off the Leaning Tower of Pisa and seeing which of those hit the ground first. 
What about Newton? Everybody knows the story. Newton and his apple sitting under a tree in the orchard outside Woolsthorpe Manor in Lincolnshire. Apple falls and either hits his head or falls in front of him and he starts to think, why does the apple fall to the ground? And he develops his theory of universal gravitation. So everybody is familiar with Newton discovering gravity under the apple tree. What is not so widely appreciated is that later that same day, Newton also discovered comedy. And for those with a wicked sense of humor, you could say that a little while later, it went even further and Newton discovered surrealism. And that I thought was amazing, the idea of a grand piano falling out of an apple tree, brilliant. What about this chap? We mentioned him in the HR diagram, the Hertz and Russell diagram in the top left, the most famous, the most prolific astronomer. And people, of course, remember him for his Cosmos series back in the 1980s, I think it was, getting on for 40 or so years ago. And the cartoon by Larson has him pointing to the stars saying, just look at those stars. There must be hundreds of them. And for anybody that doesn't get that joke, you can't have heard Carl Sagan talking the way he does during the Cosmos series. Let's have a look at a few different types of telescopes. That's a wonderful looking telescope. I, far as I know, it never actually came into existence, but it's a wonderful looking design. And as far as I can tell, it's designed such that regardless of where the telescope points in the sky, the eyepiece will always be at the same position. So for an astronomer of a given height, regardless of where they're pointing, they don't have to move. What a wonderful Victoriana piece of design. And of course, some amateurs are very good at designing and building telescopes. I don't have many details of this one, but as far as I can tell, it's made of uh, a combination of stainless steel and titanium. It must have been very difficult to work. They're not the easiest metals to deal with. And the result, well, do you really want so many shiny surfaces when you're using a reflecting telescopes? Possibly not, but you've got to admit it's an absolute work of art as well as a functioning telescope. And many amateurs are indeed very talented. Some don't really have a clue what they're doing, but indeed many have produced some wonderful devices. What about the smallest telescopes that are around? Fork-mounted telescopes. Perhaps some of you have got a fork-mounted telescope. Perhaps you didn't appreciate that the smallest fork-mounted telescope is probably a lot smaller than the one you have. It's this one. It's a little telescope mounted to a fork, and the fork is connected to a knife and a spoon, making a very nice little stable tripod. So I guess that probably is the smallest fork-mounted telescope in the world. And whilst we're in small telescopes, what is probably the best telescope in the world as far as the small category is concerned? Well, you can possibly tell from the words, probably the best telescope in the world is one that's made with a Carlsberg beer can. So in this case, the can had its top removed, a small mirror was placed in the bottom, and the eyepiece has a small 45 degree mirror uh, connected to it such that when the eyepiece is inserted into the can, it forms a little Newtonian telescope. I am told that it worked as a telescope. No comment was made as to the optical quality of the images that it produced. And when one is not enough, why would you possibly build yourself one telescope when you can build yourself two telescopes and make yourself a huge pair of binoculars? So here we have what appears to be a sort of double Dobsonian, if you like. And you can see from, uh, from the way it's constructed, the, the light from the two telescopes comes into this binocular uh, eyepiece here, one eyepiece for each telescope. And so you can judge, roughly speaking, the height of this by imagining um, an adult individual looking into the eyepieces. Those Dobsonians appear to be something of order, 16 inch or so in diameter, but that's not enough for some people. Um, some will go for a double telescope with, I would guess, something like 20 inch, half meter or so uh, mirrors. And you can appreciate that with this longer focal length, uh, the eyepieces are now up here somewhere. And therefore to use this telescope, 
almost certainly you would need some sort of uh, steps or step ladder in order to reach the eyepiece when the telescope is pointing uh, at, the, at the higher parts of the sky. For some people, even two isn't enough. And for some people, rather than think about, can we get enough money for a nice telescope with a very large aperture, they take a different approach and say, well, we're not gonna get all the money at once. So rather than build or save up enough money for a very large aperture telescope, why don't we get more modest, still many thousands of pounds, but why don't we get a more modest telescope, such as a telephoto lens here and put a camera on the back. And if money allows, we'll just buy more and more and more of them. And you could do that. And you could end up with 10 of these telescopes with 10 cameras on the back. Here they are mounted onto a large equatorial mount. That has the advantage, not only can you buy it piecemeal and still end up with a large aperture, but you have the advantage that you're taking with 10 cameras on the back, you're taking 10 images simultaneously, and you can either take the same thing 10 times over, or you can have a couple of cameras taking H-alpha and a couple of uh, cameras taking oxygen or a couple taking sulfur and others taking red, green and blue and one taking luminosity. You have the choice of taking different filters on different cameras simultaneously. And if you're gonna build up 10 and money is still available, you just keep going. And if you want 24 of them, well, no problem. You put 24 of them together. I believe this particular group uh, now have 48, uh, but I don't have a picture of that to hand. And size, of course, matters. As we all know, being astronomers, if you want to catch a lot of light, you want the largest aperture you can get hold of. And for some amateurs, that means taking things to what most of us would be considering as fair extremes. So this individual has certainly a very nice vista. One would imagine that's a very dark sky site, uh, wherever it happens to be. And you can judge, roughly speaking, the size of the, the main mirror. But I do ask you, would you really fancy being on top of that particular step ladder in pitch darkness, trying to align to a particular distant object? So each to his own, I guess. And what about the largest refractor ever made? We're moving away from amateurs now and just thinking about the largest refractor. Until fairly recently, I assumed that was the 40 inch Yerkes refractor uh, in uh, Wisconsin, but actually, it was this one. The element, the front element of this particular telescope is about 48 inches or so in diameter, a little bit larger than the Yerkes refractor. The telescope was so big it had to be permanently mounted on a set of pillars and it would look at different parts of the sky because of this siderostat, this movable mirror, which would take light from different parts of the sky and send it down the telescope. This panel at the top shows you how it worked during the great Paris exhibition of 1900, light from a distant object, sun, moon, or in principle stars, would bounce off the mirror and then go down the telescope, which is mounted horizontally in this large building here. And then if an eyepiece was placed at the end, you could use eyepiece projection to project an image of the sun or the moon or other objects. And in a darkened auditorium, I'm sure that the vision of a large portion of the moon and its craters being displayed in the, on the screen there must have been very impressive. So this shows you one end of the telescope. There's the other end of the telescope uh, mounted on wheels so that you have a little ability to focus. There's a slightly different view looking down the building. And here you can see the, um, the business end, the objective lens is at the far end. And here we have uh, a photographic plate holder and the plates look huge, um, possibly more than half a meter in size. I'm not quite sure, maybe 24 inches or so across. So enormous photographic plates, but that could be replaced with an eyepiece holder to do the eyepiece projection. I couldn't actually see the eyepiece itself, this image was simply labeled as the eyepiece holder. So presumably a relatively large lens was placed there to capture the light and project it into the auditorium. So a little bit bigger than the refractor in Yerkes Observatory, but as far as I know, after the exhibition finished, the telescope was simply scrapped. The, the objective lens went into a museum and the rest of the telescope was simply melted down. Shame. 
Not everybody, of course, works in metal. Some people work in wood. And um, one individual said that uh, they wanted to reproduce life-size the Hubble Space Telescope. They needed a big garage, a big warehouse to do it. But if you're going to build the Hubble Space Telescope, why not do it in plywood? An obvious thing to do. Yeah, of course. Some people work on a smaller scale in wood. It looks a little bit like a Dobsonian, but it looks a little bit like a cannon as well when seen from this particular angle. But you can see the amount of love and care that people put into the craftsmanship into some of their work. Some would prefer to simply buy an optical tube assembly off the shelf, as it were. But here, a person has taken an OTA and built themselves a wooden equatorial mount and then taken a standard optical tube assembly and put it in this fork mounting. A well-known amateur astronomer of old is Russell Porter, who built telescopes not only that were very functional, but some of them were just beautiful ornaments. Here, a garden telescope where the, uh, the primary mirror you can't quite see in this area here, and a small 45 degree mirror and a tiny eyepiece. So it was a garden ornament, but it was still a functional Newtonian telescope as well. And of course, some people build their telescopes and some people want an observatory to put their telescopes in, having put a certain amount of effort into their telescope or a certain amount of cash into buying one, they want an observatory to put it in. What better place than the Palomar Observatory? What a beautiful setting. I visited that observatory. That's the dome for the 200 inch or the five meter Hale telescope. I went there in 1982 when I was a student. Um, I think I've still got that shirt and probably those shoes as well. But in 1982, I visited the Hale Telescope and I thought that's impressive. One day I'm going to own a house with a garden big enough to build that in the back garden. OK, great aspiration, but I had to downsize my aspiration somewhat. And 16 years later, in 1998, I had a house which was just about big enough to have an observatory in the back garden and I decided on an 8 by 6 b and shed which I converted. Not quite as spectacular as the Hale Dome but you've got to go with what you've got to get. Inside that particular um, observatory I had the roof hinged so I could access the sky and you can get an idea of the vintage there, not necessarily from the 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, but you can judge it from the fact that the laptop looks like a brick rather than a rather thin thing that you would get these days. Some people put a huge amount of effort. I bought a B&Q shed and converted it to an observatory, but you can see that some people put their heart and soul into building an observatory in their back garden. I can't quite judge exactly how big that is. Maybe gardeners can tell from the size of the flowers in the foreground there, but you can see the amount of effort that's gone into making that geodesic dome rather than simply buying a fiberglass dome uh, or doing it any other way with, with more uh, regular sort of shapes. So a beautiful amount of craftsmanship. But of course, the one problem, even if you've got a telescope and you've put it into your back garden, then that's not necessarily ideal because it depends where you live. If you live in a light polluted area, then having a telescope in your back garden is very convenient, but it's not necessarily the darkest skies. Wouldn't it be great if you could simply take your observatory with you such that you could go to wherever you've got dark skies and you would be able to take the observatory with you? Of course, you can't do that unless you put the observatory and build it into a caravan. Great idea, number 36. What a fantastic idea. Half caravan, half observatory. You tow that to, to wherever you want to do your observing, or you go on holiday to wherever you want to go. And if you get some nice dark skies, you do your observing for as many hours as you want. And when you're finished, you collapse into bed. You don't have to worry about the fact that the accommodation and the observatory have been separated. Wonderful idea. I guess for some of us, we may not have a car that's big enough to tow a rather large Leviathan like that. So maybe that's not suitable for everybody. 
So what's the alternative? Well, you can get a smaller portable observatory. That's the sort of thing you could go for if you wanted something a little bit smaller and you just wanted for it to uh, protect perhaps a small telescope rather than get 16 of your friends in there and have a little star party. As well as little portable observatories, you can of course get go-to telescopes. Here's a wonderful telescope on wheels. I don't know if you need a license to drive this thing. It appears to be on, a, on an equatorial mount. And I presume you can take that wherever you want to go to do your observing. It's by no means the earliest design of go-to telescope. I found this one, uh, which is very interesting. Something of order eight or nine inch refractor, I believe mounted uh, atop a car. I'm not sure of the vintage. I don't know if this is the 1950s, but I, I really can't pin down the date. You might say that's ridiculous putting such a large telescope on a car. For instance, it would be fine in principle for looking at the horizon, but you couldn't point it up in the air because of the car roof. Well, not true. Um, you can actually crank the handle, which raises the central pier, which allows you to use that telescope, not quite to the zenith, but certainly to very high altitudes, very high elevations. But you might still look at that and say, well, that's still crazy. Um, the car can't be stable, surely. And a telescope of that size, nobody in their right minds would actually for real this was probably a publicity stunt. Nobody for real would actually put a working telescope on top of a car. Unless you come from America, in which case it makes perfect sense whatsoever. And again, we see something like maybe six, seven, eight inch refractor, a uh, very long focal length from the appearance of it. In this case, mounted on top of a Volvo. I believe this individual lived in Florida at the time, and I'm guessing that he would drive around to dark skies uh, and use this particular beast. Notice the back bumper of the Volvo has got a little bit of wood jacked underneath it, presumably to stop the Volvo moving whilst observations were being made. Is that the largest example of a telescope that was made to be mobile? Well, not quite, but now we're getting well out of the range of amateurs. And of course, what we have here is the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Basically, stick a telescope in the back of a 747. If you're NASA, you can afford to do that. But if you're anybody else, uh, that's a little outside the range of most amateurs. And I think we've got to the point now where we'd better stop. And I will acknowledge the various uh, sites from which I've taken cartoons or other material. So thank you all for listening. That's terrific. Steve, do you want me to make you host and then that might let you set the video for the next bit? Can you just give me a couple of minutes for the... Um, if I can remember where it is, um... Yes, if you, if you care to make me co-host, I'll have a quick look. I can't remember if it has to be done from the web page or whether it's done from in here. The original meeting settings certainly had videos. So. Um, advanced sharing options. Da, 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 da. I think, let me just check. Yep, there it is. I found it. Um, for future reference, I think host can do this if you look in the um, the green button at the bottom yeah. next to it is the up arrow yeah. and it's an advanced sharing options that's where you allow um what's it called it's called um one participant can share at a time if it's set to multiple participants you can't use the higher bit rates of videos so no. if it's set to one participant can share at a time then videos are allowed okay Thanks. So can we just take a couple of minutes break before we start the next one? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, five minute comfort break for everybody perhaps? Yep. Yes. Yep, good. <laughs> I'll, I'll go and get comfortable. Oh. I'll just get some more water. I'm gonna go get one out. Okay. So just by the by, 
I had a flight on the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, which was the predecessor of the SOFIA. And it's a most interesting thing because you're sitting in this plane and there is this telescope jiggling around as it, as it tries to lock onto stars. But if you stop for a second and think about it, actually, the telescope is dead still. It's the plane that's jiggling around <laughs> because the telescope is locked onto a star and the, the plane you're actually sitting in is doing the jiggling. It's a, a really strange uh, mental leap you have to make because standing in the plane, what you see is the telescope moving, but of course the telescope's not moving at all. It's the airplane that's moving around the mountain. Mm
nothing to do with astronomy, but on Friday I had a tree sparrow uh, fledge from one of my nest, bo nest boxes and two from another nest box. Unmute. Very good, Graham. Mm -hmm. else is mm -hmm. There are tree sparrows in two other nest boxes, but the way they've built their nest. Just, yeah. He keeps moving the camera every time I change something, so. Good evening again. It barely seems like five minutes since I was last talking to you. And this is Ancient Light. You can see from the subtitle, it's about imaging a quasar without using a telescope. You may have noticed that things have been different for the last 12, 15 months or so. In 2020, life as we knew it changed because of life in lockdown. This object gave rise to a lot of these objects scattered over floors and pavements all over the place. People tended to look down, but I remembered Stephen Hawking's words. Remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. I thought, right, okay, remember to look up at the stars. How far up can you actually look using a camera, but not using a telescope? That's when I decided that in the middle of last year, I needed a challenge. And this was the challenge I set myself. We all know that the universe is vast and ancient, and we know that large telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope, for instance, have imaged galaxies that are billions of light years distant. Is it possible to capture an image of one of these very remote objects, but without using a telescope? And the spoiler alert is because I'm giving you this talk. Yes, it is. So I read this paper about luminous quasars. And we won't bother about all the detail, but we have to think about what a quasar is. A quasar is the nucleus of a galaxy. It's a particular type of galaxy with a nucleus that's called an active galactic nucleus. It's the nucleus of a galaxy that emits, emits enough light to be seen at enormous distances, for instance, distances of many billions of light years. So a quasar is an ideal object if you want to see as far as possible. That's an artist's impression. We don't actually know what a quasar looks like because we've never seen one close up. But it is thought that what's going on in the heart of a quasar is that there is a supermassive black hole similar to what's in the center of most galaxies. But in a quasar, that supermassive black hole is feeding on surrounding matter, which is falling into the black hole. And on the way in, some of that matter is converted to energy and it produces a huge amount of radiation. So a very distant object has had its spectrum measured by this particular group of people in this uh, paper that was published in 2019. They took the spectrum of a particular object that I was interested in because it looked very distant and it was high in the sky as seen from the UK. That spectrum, looking at the intensity of light from the quasar as a function of the wavelength from blue on the left to red on the right, that doesn't look like a very interesting spectrum. But the interesting feature that came out of this when they looked at this was that that feature there, which appears in the spectrum at 6,500 angstroms, 
This, these are units of angstroms. If you prefer, divide by 10 to get units of nanometers, so 650 nanometers. That particular peak was identified as the same peak that would appear in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum if the object wasn't moving. So remember, when objects are moving away from us, the spectrum gets red shifted, in other words, shifted to the right. So a particular peak that should occur at 1200 angstroms in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum has been shifted all the way to 6500 angstroms by the recession velocity of this object. It's moving away from us so fast, it's gone from 1200 to 6500. And to quantify the redshift, we take how much it's moved by, in this case, 65 minus 12 is 5300. We take that number and divide it by the original wave number, in other words, 1200. The difference of these two numbers, 5300, divided by 1200, that quantifies the redshift. And the redshift comes out to be 4.3 for this particular object. And a redshift of 4.3 means that this quasar is very remote. And we'll talk about the actual distances in just a few slides time. So I decided, right, I'm going to get out my camera and I'm going to get out my telephoto lens. Um, the, the particular beastie I've got here, the, the Nikon camera and a 300 millimeter lens. Not a, a particularly massive lens, 300 millimeters is, a, is quite modest by today's standards. And I mounted the camera and lens on a sky tracker, a star tracker, that white box on the left hand side is basically just a motorized box that will turn the camera at one revolution per day. So as long as you use this little polar scope here to point and line up on Polaris, then this axis should be lined up with the Earth's axis and therefore rotating the camera at once a day, the camera should follow the stars if everything works correctly. Now this particular camera and lens that I'm talking about, this is the, the equipment that I use for wildlife photography. This is in no way customized, in no way modified for astrophotography. It's just the particular combination that I would use if, for instance, I ever get back to going on safari in Africa, which I like to do every once in a while, in a year or two's time when it might be possible again, this is the camera and lens that I would use, for instance, to take pictures of zebra, like this particular picture here taken a couple of years ago. So if your camera equipment is designed to work in daylight and take pictures of zebras, can that same equipment capture a quasar on the other side of the observable universe? That's the question I was asking myself. So I figured out where the object was. I looked up its coordinates and its coordinates happens to be the quasar is in the constellation of Draco. So there's Draco, there's Ursa, Ursa Minor on the right hand side, there's Polaris of course, and this is where the quasar is located. That dot there is not the quasar, that happens to be a fifth magnitude star, which luckily is right next door to the quasar in terms of our line of sight. So I could see that by setting up the camera. If I knew that star was centered in my camera field of view, I knew the quasar was sort of right next door. I focused on a nearby star, which was about eighth magnitude to make sure the focusing was spot on and then took a long exposure not as one single long exposure, but I took a series of short exposures and added them together. A number of advantages in doing that. Uh, one advantage is your tracking doesn't have to be perfect for two hours. If it happens to drift ever so slightly, that's okay. You've got lots of images. You make sure they're all lined up on top of each other before you add them all together. The other advantage was that during the two hours of this particular night, some clouds were scudding by. So by taking a large number of short exposures afterwards, when it was all done, I simply went through them all and threw away the ones that had clouds spoiling the image and added together all the remaining images, which added up to something of order, two hours exposure. There's the bright star, it happens to be called AT Draco, right in the center there. And the quasar should be in the middle of that square according to its coordinate. So I took the image that I had taken on that particular night in July of last year and I blew it up to see what was there. And there, as indicated by the two red lines, there is the quasar. So yes, you can capture 
this very distant object. Most of the light from the quasar, by the time I'd taken these images and lined them all up to get my two hour exposure, most of the light from the quasar had actually ended up in just about one pixel. In this little blow up on the left hand side, I've just brightened some of the fainter pixels. You can perhaps see a couple of stars in the background there as well. I've brightened some of those other pixels just to make it a little easier to see. But most of the light has gone into that single pixel right in the middle of the quasar. Just a, a quick diversion, just to say what we could expect in terms of resolution. This is a telephoto lens. It's got, it's an F4 lens, so its front element is about 75 millimeters or so in diameter. From that, you can calculate what resolution can you expect if the lens is perfect. If there were no aberrations in the lens, and given that I paid quite a few hundred pounds for this lens, I would hope that there's no serious aberrations. If it was essentially perfect, you would expect to be able to resolve to angles down to about nine micro radians, nine uh, millionths of a radian, which equates to something a little bit less than two arc seconds. And looking at the size of pixels in the chip in the camera, the, uh, the pixels are a little bit larger than that. The pixels would be about 15 micro radians corresponding to about three arc seconds. And on that particular summer's evening, the seeing might have been of order two arc seconds. So the resolution of the lens, the resolution of the camera and the seeing are all in the same sort of ballpark of about two-ish arc seconds. Just for comparison, just to give you an idea of size, if we took an object the size of the Milky Way galaxy and placed it at many billions of light years, how large would it appear? Well, it would appear to be a couple of pixels or so. That gives you an idea of what we're looking at here. Just returning to this particular crop of this tiny region, it happens to be about eight by eight arc minutes, something of order, a tenth of a degree on a side. As well as identifying the quasar in the middle, I checked these blobs because some of them didn't look very circular and I thought that the tracking was okay. So I figured some of these non-circular blobs might be galaxies. So I checked that star field against the star field from a research telescope and identified that indeed some of these objects aren't stars, some of these objects are galaxies. And there are at least 10 galaxies that I could see. Some of those might be too faint to show up on your screen at the moment, and some of them definitely looks like stars. So you'll just have to take my word for it that I've identified those as being non-stellar objects. So if I've caught 10 of them in that particular crop of the image, assuming there's a similar number everywhere, and there's no reason to assume otherwise, then if I've caught 10 of them in that area, then the number of galaxies in the whole image is probably about 7,000 galaxies. So I've called this the Barrett Deep Field simply because by coincidence, the number of galaxies I've caught in that image is probably about the same. It's in the same ballpark as the number of galaxies that were caught in the Hubble Deep Field. I'm not claiming this image is as good, but it's interesting to note that the numbers work out very similarly. So what about the distance? We've said that, yes, we can catch the light from this quasar, but just how distant is this quasar? What is the distance to the quasar? Well, the distance is a bit of a problem. Light left this particular galaxy. I'm going to use galaxy and, and quasar interchangeably. A galaxy with a quasar at its core, effectively, produced some light, and that light left the, uh, the object, the quasar, a long time ago on its way to Earth. So you could say that was the distance then when the light left. But of course, as the light is on its way to Earth, the universe continues to expand. The galaxy was at a particular distance from us when the light left, but throughout the light's journey, the universe continued to expand and the galaxy is along for the ride, so the distance is increasing and eventually the light makes it to Earth and enters my camera, at which point the galaxy is even further away from Earth. So when we talk about the distance to the quasar, what do we mean? Do we mean the distance as it was when the light originally left? Do we mean the distance that the galaxy is now from Earth? Or do we mean the distance that the light has traveled? 
which is more than the first, but less than the second distance. So which of these three distances is the correct one? Well, there's no such thing as correct. They are just three ways of defining the distance. And there is yet one other problem, and that is when we think of the light traveling from the galaxy to the Earth, remember throughout its entire journey, the light is traveling through space and space is expanding at the same time. So it's actually quite tricky to work out how far has the light traveled because the light is traveling through space and space is changing as the light is traveling through space. If we want an analogy to try and make that a little more concrete, we can think about a swimmer moving through water. If a swimmer can swim through water at two meters per second, but the water is flowing because space is expanding, it's like the water flowing against the swimmer. It's like swimming against the tide. The light is moving through space, but space is being stretched. Another analogy that's quite useful in, in terms of thinking about this is thinking about an ant moving along a rubber band. If we think about an ant moving along a rubber band, we can see how far the ant has moved. But what if we start stretching the rubber band whilst the ant is in motion? Then you can ask the question, how far has the ant walked? But it's a difficult thing to measure because every step the ant takes, the rubber band underneath his or her feet is being stretched. So it's a tricky problem to actually work out. But it can be done as long as we have some idea of how the universe is expanding. In other words, if we have some mathematical model which tells us the universe is probably expanding like this. It used to expand at that rate and now is, it's expanding at this rate. And this is how it's expanded all of the time between a distant time in the past and the present. And that's what these curves show. They're calculated curves for what is the distance to an object for a given redshift. In other words, if we were to look at an object which has a redshift of one, that's a particular distance from us, and we can calculate how far the object was, the blue line, when the light left, how far the light has traveled, that's the green line, and where is that object now? That's the red line. You can see that if the object is not very far away from us, if the redshift is 0.1, for instance, then these three lines are effectively the same thing. In other words, the universe hasn't changed much from the length of time it took the light to go from the object to us, if the object is very close. But the further an object is away from us, the more the universe expands in the interval between the light leaving the object and the light arriving at us, which is why these three curves diverge away from each other. So let's have a think about what that means for our object. Rather than think about the universe in its entirety, let's just think about that galaxy at a redshift of 4.3. From our understanding of how the universe expands, we can read off the numbers corresponding to our quasar. And there are those three numbers there. Let's just get rid of those lines because they're distracting. Those are the only three numbers we care about at the moment. So what it means was the quasar was about five billion light years away from us when the light that we caught here was emitted from the quasar. And the light has been traveling for over 12 billion years between when it left and when it arrived in the camera. Remember, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So 12.4 is actually about 90% of the age of the universe. The light that made that image has been traveling for 90% of the time that the universe has been in existence. That is a really mind boggling number. And during those 12 billion years, the universe has continued to expand and the quasar is even further away. The quasar is now 25 billion light years away because the universe continued to expand during that light travel time of 12 and a bit billion years. But if you're still awake, you may notice something very interesting. The quasar has gone from 5 billion light years distant to 
25 billion light years distant. It's changed its distance by 20 billion light years over a time period of 12 billion years. So a quick back of the envelope calculation tells us something very interesting. During 12 billion years, the distance to the quasar has increased by more than 12 billion light years. Speed is distance over time. It's changed by 20 billion light years in a time period of 12 billion years. That means that the object, the quasar, is moving away from us on average by 1.6 times the speed of light. In other words, it's been moving away from us at more than the speed of light. It is receding faster than the speed of light. Not only that, if we do have a reasonable understanding of how the universe has expanded, we can work out what its speed was originally and what its speed is now. And we can actually plot that. And it turns out that when the light left the quasar, back in these early days of the universe, the quasar was receding from us at approximately 2.2 times the speed of light. And it started slowing down. That's perhaps no surprise. We were in an expanding universe. And after the Big Bang produced the expansion, gravity presumably has started to slow the expansion down. So it's no surprise that the speed started to fall. But the real surprise is what's going on after about halfway? It's going up again. After initially slowing down, the quasar is now not only moving away from us, it is accelerating away from us. That line is now going up. Its recession speed is increasing day on day on day. It's moving away approximately 1.7 times the speed of light, and every day it's moving away a little bit faster. In other words, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Something that was discovered 20 or so years ago, and it's very nice to sort of look at this particular model of how the expansion has changed and actually see that in terms of our quasar accelerating away from us. So we can't get that from the photograph. We can only get it by modeling how we think the universe has behaved. But it's interesting to note that the average is about 1.6, it started off faster and it's currently faster. It decelerated and then accelerated. And it has been accelerating for the last, what, five or six billion years. Remember, this doesn't violate anything that Einstein said about objects moving faster than light. The light is moving through space at the only speed it can move through space, the speed of light, the speed of light in a vacuum, C. But space itself is expanding and the galaxy is along for the ride. And so the galaxy is being carried away from us because it's being carried, if you like, by the expanding universe. So objects, including light, can only move through space, no faster than the speed of light. But space can expand at any speed it likes. And it was originally expanding much, 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 much faster than light but then it slowed down and now it appears to be speeding up again. So that was a big surprise 20 years ago because nobody expected that curve to have an uptick in it. If we think about it in terms of the light, here I've plotted on a chart of distance away from us on the horizontal scale and time since the Big Bang on this vertical scale. So there's us at zero distance, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. So there, the, uh, the little amber dot there is us here and now. And this green dot, five billion light years away from us, something like one and a half billion years after the Big Bang, remember 12, 12 and more billion years ago, that's when the light left the quasar. If the quasar then was five billion light years away, you would half expect the light to get closer to us and closer to us and closer to us and closer to us. And as time went by, remember, time goes vertically in this particular plot. So you might expect the light to get closer and closer and closer to us. But remember, the light is trying to move through space, which is expanding faster than light. This is like a swimmer swimming through water that's flowing against them 
and the speed of the water flow is faster than they can swim. So they get dragged backwards by the water. It's the same idea here. So actually, because the quasar is receding from us faster than light, or space is expanding faster than light, if you prefer, the actual path of the light is not that dotted arrow. The path of the light is more like this. Oops. The light starts from the quasar, it's trying to get to us, but actually it's being dragged backwards. And for the first two billion years or so, the light is actually getting further away from us. It's trying to come towards us, but space is dragging it backwards. And for two to two and a half billion years, that is what's happening to the light. It's getting further away from us. But by the time something like four billion years after the Big Bang, finally the light starts to make some headway and eventually does make it to us. It takes obviously 12 billion years. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is weird in itself. The idea that light is trying to get to us but is being dra dragged backwards by the expansion of the universe. That takes some getting used to when, even when you read it, you still have to stop and think, huh? And to try and get your head around it, you need a few minutes thought. If we think about what the quasar was doing, the green line is what the light did. As soon as the light left the quasar, it was dragged backwards for a while, but eventually made it to us. What was the quasar doing? Well, the quasar, remember, is just along for the ride as the universe expands. And so the quasar goes flying off to the point where um, at the now point of 13.8 billion years, it's something like 25 billion light years away from us. I've shown it as a dotted line because remember the previous slide showed that the velocity, the recession velocity of the quasar is actually changing. It was fast and then it slowed down and now it's getting fast again. So that line there, it should really be changing its gradient because the, the velocity isn't fixed. The velocity was high and then low and then high again. So that should be a little bit of a wavy line, but I couldn't work out exactly what the curve ought to look like. So I just put it as a dotted line to indicate that when the light and the quasar parted company, the light took the green path and the quasar took the red path on this distance time graph here. When I look at the image, it might only be a pixel, but I like to think about the journey that the light has had. The light was emitted by the quasar 1.4 billion years after the Big Bang. The light traveled for something like 8 billion years before even the sun and the earth existed and the sun and the earth were born some four and a half billion years ago and the light continued its journey for those two, four and a half billion years. Life evolved on earth, the light traveled on. Dinosaurs came and went, the light traveled on. In the last million years or so of its journey, the light arrived at the edge of our Milky Way galaxy. It would have crossed a few spiral arms and then entered the solar system. In the last few hours, it would have crossed the solar system, arrived at Earth, traveled through the atmosphere in a fraction of a second. It would have hurtled towards England, dodged, dodged a couple of clouds, entered the lens and arrived at the sensor of the camera. Just a pixel, but what a journey. Here's a graphical summary of what I've been saying. I took my camera and telephoto lens, nothing special, just an ordinary camera and telephoto lens, put it on a star tracker so that I could take a long exposure, pointed it in the direction of Draco where I expected this quasar to exist, and right next door to the star you can see at the centre of the main image, in the inset in the top right, you can see that is the quasar, confirmed by plate solving that particular image to make sure I had the coordinates absolutely bang on. So yes, without a telescope, it is possible to catch what I think of as the quasar's ancient light. Thank you all for listening. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, excellent.
I would anticipate possibly more questions than the previous talk on the lighter side of astronomy. <laughs> so I'm quite happy to take whatever questions come my way. And yes, it is mind boggling, yes. Mm -hmm. My mind's too boggled to have any. <laughs> <laughs> too boggled for a question. I know, it just sort of blows your mind. It, it does. I mean, I like quasars, you know, they're interesting objects, but it just... <laughs> yes. It's, it's mind boggling for various reasons. Uh, very, well, a, the, the fact that the universe exists that way, but B, the fact that you can actually catch these things. That mm. It's not just yeah. the Hubble Space Telescope, which is capable of looking at galaxies on the other side of the observable universe. You can do it yourself. That's mm. really amazing. Mm. So I'm, I'm thankful for the pandemic for making me think about doing that. Mm. Mm. Like the only thing I'm thankful for the mm. pandemic for, I think, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I like the adaptive the ad ad adaptation of the Scotch Mount, the modern version, very good. Mm -hmm. The pouching your camera and, for, and lining up on the Pole Star. Mm -hmm. That's the original Scotch Mount, which was originally driven by 50 hertz motor, and then yeah. and nowadays with stepping motors. Yeah, yeah indeed. Yes, I built myself, a, you know, basically a barn door mount. I built one to take yeah. on holiday. Th this picture was taken with the tracker that I was just showing you. So I used my own um, DIY tracker for a while. But then after a few years, I bought this little white box because it was very convenient and small and easily fits into luggage. Mm -hmm. So this was a picture I took when I was last in Kenya under their beautifully dark skies. Oh, it's beautiful. Because some of the, the telescopes in the first talk, the, the wooden ones in particular, <coughs> in the observatories, they were really, you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. They were really beautiful. We've gone for several years to um, the Scarborough Astro <coughs> Dolby Forest. It's obviously it's not been on the last couple of years, but we must have been for at least 12 times over the years. And it's surprising there the number of really good amateur built telescopes like those you saw, really well shaped and carved and, uh, and very accurate as well, you know, computer driven. Uh, there's a lot of people around the country doing this sort of thing. Mm. Yeah. Um, Kenny Kerr is asking what software do you use to stack the images? Um, as was mentioned by uh, Alice Amanda right at the beginning there, um, I have an interest in image processing and image analysis. So the, the short answer is I write my own software. Mm. It's it, the software I use for analyzing images for my research, I thought, what the hell, I may as well use the same software for stacking astro images. So adapted it for astro imaging as well. Mm. Yeah. And somebody else commenting, glad we didn't have to understand the maths, the underlying maths. That's <laughs> fair enough. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's mind boggling just trying to get your head around the idea before you start worrying about the maths. I know. Yeah. I know. Steve, I don't know if I fully understand it, but with, with the with the star with the sorry, the quasar moving away at, at that terrific speed and expansion. Yep. And I guess we in the Milky Way must be moving away as well. Uh, is, 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 that all, is, that just, is that part of the number or do you have to allow for that as well? Are we all moving in the same direction as it were? No, the, the, there is no such thing as an absolute direction. All motion is relative. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the recession velocity, meaning the velocity of an object relative to us. Relative to us. Because of course, that, that's all we can measure. Yes. So if you, were to, if you were to go to a different um, location, you would measure a different recession velocity. Right. All so, objects are moving away from all objects. Mm -hmm. And there's no such thing as a, a zero, as it were. We just arbitrarily say, let's just work out everything because all our observations are relative to us and all our redshift measurements must be the recession velocity relative to us. Mm 
I see sort of drop up in the same number. That's yes, it, it, that, that number takes into account everything, if you like. It, it takes into account what space is doing between us and the object. Mm. And there's no such thing as motion or stationary in the sense that it's all relative, yes. Relative to our own frame of reference. Yep, absolutely, yep. And the other thing I didn't fully understand was what your diagram is showing the, uh, the change with uh, either red or green, I think, or a blue. I forget what the... What the, the yeah. The blue was uh, the actual, I think, from what I remember. Is that correct? Blue is the distance when the light left the object. It seemed to, it didn't follow a straight line. It, it, it went down. It started to dip down that, that, that curve. What, what, I don't, I don't, yes, because the, the, the larger the redshift, the further back in time you're looking. Okay? Right, yes. If you look back far enough, the universe used to be smaller. Oh, I see. All right. It's ah, yeah, it's one of those, it's one of those aha moments, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. If you go back far enough in time, you're looking back to a time when the universe used to be a lot smaller than it is now. And it's one of these things that, you know, you sort of, it's the, it's the sort of thing that you have to look at the, uh, the, the graph or look at the words on a piece of paper and you have to sit with a cup of tea and think about it for a few minutes to say is that right i think it's, it's, it's none, of, none of this is intuitive we don't teach this in nursery schools for good reason <laughs> it is not intuitive and it's not the sort of thing that you can just say here it's obvious look at this it's the sort of thing you have to think about and part of the problem is people are not used to the idea of thinking about what if the universe is continually changing, i.e. continually expanding. That's not a day-to-day -day experience. You don't ever go to work moving on a travelator that's continuously stretching or something like that. So you never have an idea, you never have a way of using common sense to tell you what would it be like if I was walking along a travelator made of rubber that kept stretching when I was trying to walk along it. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing we're dealing with when light is traveling through an expanding universe, but it is not common sense because common sense doesn't ever equip you for that sort of situation. Yeah. It's you have to stop and think and, um, and scratch your chin and have a, more than one cup of tea before <laughs> you can get your head around it. I still find it difficult uh, to, to visualize why we can see the laser at all, the, the, the equator at all, for the yep. simple reason that we are expanding faster than the light is traveling towards us. I take yep. it that the light we're seeing yep. is from much earlier in the universe. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is the, 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 the catch. So, yeah. The, yeah. There's, there's two ways of thinking of that. One is a verbal explanation, but I also have a visual explanation and I'll happily share the slides with you. I'll, I'll send a link to the slides so you can have a look. The simplest explanation is if I'm swimming forward, but the water is pushing me back, as long as I can swim into slightly slower moving water, I will eventually make it. Right. So yes, I'm getting pushed back, by let's say a tide pushing me back at four meters a second. But if I can swim into slower moving water that's moving at 3.9 meters a second, and if I can keep swimming into water that's moving at 3.8 meters a second, if I keep on going, eventually I will find myself in water that's not pushing me backwards. Eventually I will start to make headway. Hi. Uh, Steve, I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed from the audience rough age profile that quite a few people are of sufficient age to remember one uh, heretic called Holton Arp. Are there any modern versions of Holton Arp who hold the same views, or are they too worried about having their careers destroyed by even daring to suggest that the redshift, in fact, is not a phenomenon with regard to? Uh, receding objects? I th it, it gets occasional mention, but I think the latter point you made, nobody is staking their career on the fact that these redshifts are anything but cosmological redshifts. There is so much evidence, and it's not just the redshift, there's all the bits of evidence that tie together. All the evidence that the universe started with a Big Bang and led to expansion, 
all the evidence that's there, the hydrogen, the helium, the cosmic microwave background, et cetera, it all gives us a consistent picture of how the universe is behaving. If you want to kill the expansion of the universe and say the red shifts have a different explanation, then you've got to find alternative explanations for other observations as well. So it's a tricky thing to deal with. And as far as I know, no one is pinning their career on that. Yeah. Can, can I ask, go back to the, the expansion of the, the universe thing? Yep. Um, I'm just trying to get my head around this, but if, if the universe was expanding and let's say it expanded to twice the size, does that mean everything in the universe, galaxies and atoms, are also expanding to twice, twice the size? Because if they're not, an alternative way of looking at it is that the universe is static and everything inside the universe is shrinking. The, when we talk about space expanding, certain objects are carried along by the expansion of space. But for instance, the, the atoms in your body are not separating as the universe expands because they are not gravitationally bound. They are part of a system which is dominated by other forces. For instance, electromagnetic forces, the various positive and negative charges of all the particles, the, the protons and the electrons in your body are keeping your body a certain size. And the expansion of the universe has a gravitational effect on large scales, but it does not tear atoms apart on small scales because gravity doesn't determine the size of an atom. The size of an atom is dominated by the quantum mechanics, which is from the electromagnetism. Gravity does not have any part to play in how an electron orbits a proton. So the expansion of space, an atom does not care about that. A galaxy cares because a galaxy is formed from gravitational forces. So galaxies will move apart as the universe expands. Atoms don't give a damn. An atom will always be a size of an atom. Yeah, OK, um, I get that about the atoms, but then the galaxies, as they move apart, are also getting bigger because they are also gravitationally held together. They are, they are held together by gravity on a much smaller scale than the expansion of the universe. So for instance, two galaxies that are attracting each other, for instance, the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy, their mutual gravity is dominating over the expansion of the universe, which is a much, if you like, a much weaker effect. If nothing is pulling on a galaxy, then it will, if you like, be carried along just like a cork will be carried along by a, the flow of water. But if anything else is making that cork behave a different way, like two galaxies being attracted to each other, that will dominate. So again, the Milky Way and the Andromeda are going to collide, regardless of whether the universe continues to expand or not. The Milky Way and Andromeda are pulling on each other strongly enough that that will overrule any expansion they might feel. In other words, the expansion is very weak compared to this really strong attraction because these galaxies are right next door to each other. So it's all a question of scale. At small scale, it doesn't matter. At huge scales, it starts to dominate. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Did anything else come into the chat? Um, uh, goodbye. OK, goodbye. Can, can I ask a question following yeah. on from what you just said? Yep. Uh, I take it then that in an individual galaxy, um, the stars aren't, aren't getting further apart because they're being attracted yes. more fully yes. than the, the expansion is trying to pull them apart. That's right, yes. So. I'm not sure the easiest way of sort of drawing the, the, the best picture, but if local forces are holding things together, they will continue to hold things together. But if an object is floating in the middle of nowhere doing nothing, it will get carried along by the so-called Hubble flow, just like an object sitting in water will be carried along by the water. Thank you. Uh, you were saying at one stage that um, the light coming from the galaxy 
was in fact receding from us. It was, it was getting further away, and yep. then it started getting closer. At yep. what stage, or or what was the change of mechanism for that? Um, if you'll bear with me, I think the easiest way to actually show that is is a little graphic that I prepared because I think a graphic is easier to deal with than lots of words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me just get rid of that because I don't like that over the top. Okay, because I often get this question and it's a perfectly reasonable question and I had to sit and think about it. And once I'd thought about it, I thought of this analogy, thinking about the idea of either ants on rubber bands or water flow. And this might help you understand what's going on. So this is again, the same question as before. If an, if an object is receding from us faster than the speed of light, how can its light ever reach us? So the analogy is a person who's the analogy for light is swimming through water, which is the analogy for space, and the water is flowing faster than the person can swim. In other words, space is expanding faster than light. So let's see how that works. In this diagram, distance is, uh, as you can see in the scale at the top, and time is running downwards. So what's going on here is there are four corks in the water, and this water is moving away from the shoreline at one meter per second. And this water is moving at two meters a second, and this water is moving at three meters a second, and this water is moving at four meters a second. That's effectively the Hubble law. The further away an object is from the shoreline, the faster it's moving. Okay, so we can say to ourselves, right, what if we start with a swimmer at this particular point, 40 meters from the shoreline? They are in water, which is, if you look down here, that this water on this gray line is moving away from the shoreline at four meters a second. So we can ask what happens to that swimmer in 10 seconds. So let's jump to the next line. In 10 seconds, the water will have pulled that swimmer back by um, 40 meters because the water is moving at four meters a second. So in 10 seconds, it will pull the swimmer back 40 meters. But of course, the, the swimmer is swimming forward at two meters a second. So the swimmer ends up there. The swimmer, although they are trying to swim to the shoreline, the swimmer is further away from the shoreline. But the important thing is that the swimmer is now in water that is flowing at three meters a second. So what happens 10 seconds later? They get dragged backwards 30 meters and they swim forward 20 meters. So they now end up there. So they are now in even slower water. What happens 10 seconds later? They get dragged backwards by 20 odd meters and they move forward 20 odd meters. So they are now there. And the important thing is that now they are in water that is flowing at less than two meters a second. They have, by persevering, ended up in water that is flowing slower than they can swim. So from this point onwards, they would make headway into the shoreline. In other words, they start by getting dragged backwards, but as long as they keep swimming, and as long as they keep moving into ever slower water, they will eventually, if they don't get exhausted, they will eventually be able to make their way to the shoreline. And it's the same for light. As long as the light continues to try and make its way to us, the light will find itself in space that is expanding more and more slowly as it gets closer and closer to us. So you get this characteristic curve. Nothing actually changes as such. It's a continuous process of always getting just a little bit closer, just getting a little bit into slower water. The effect of them getting dragged backwards gets less and less and less and less, and eventually they start to make headway towards the shore. It is not intuitive. You have to look at that and you have to think, is that right? I'll make those slides available to you and you can check my numbers for how much they get dragged backwards in 10 seconds and how much headway they make. And I hope you agree that using that water analogy, it looks like they would always be dragged backwards, but actually they do eventually make it to the shoreline. Yeah, okay, thank you.
I'm just checking the bits in the chat here. Just... Um... Well, as I said before, I'll make the slides of the talks and the slides of that little analogy with the Hubble flow. I'll make those available to you so you can sit and have a think about it at your leisure over a cup of tea, because none of these things, I don't think, ever sink in immediately. Mm -hmm. The universe is a weird place in some senses. <laughs> and our brains were not really designed to understand them, the universe. So the fact that we can make any headway in understanding what's out there is pretty amazing in its own right. No. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. I think everybody's just um, um, been, minds have just been blown. <laughs> yep, that's it. Yep. Right. Yes, I, I don't take silence as an insult. I take that as meaning people are thinking, hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Steve, Steve, I have to say, I have to say, based upon what you've said, I think you would even have managed to get Halton Arp as a convert, I tell you. <laughs> well oh, done. Praise e indeed. Yeah, thank you. E excellent talk. Thank you very much indeed. Very original way of doing it. I was very impressed. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. I'd like to say you, you made a complicated subject almost understandable. <laughs> almost. <laughs> no, you're... It, it, well, as uh, I say, read the slides and have a think about it. And I'm very uh, happy. If, if, if it takes a little bit of thought and you're still not happy, I'm very happy to take emails. Um, Alice Amanda et al have got my email. So if you ever want to get in touch with me saying, I still don't understand how this can work, yeah. by all means, drop me an email. Well, if, if I may um, piggyback on your presentation, um, it, it's interesting we're talking about the water, which uh, reminded me that my granddaughter, when she was about 11, got invited to uh, join uh, a canoeing club at South Acres Park. And she learned how to paddle in a wee sort of flamboyantly colored kayak. And last week, she qualified for the British Olympic team. Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic. That's brilliant. She'll be going to Tokyo. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Thank you. We're uh, very proud. Congratulations from, from me. We, we will. We will. Uh, well, that's really brilliant. I'll need to watch out for her at the time. Her name's Deborah Kerr, uh, like the film star, and, right. uh, and she's a sprint kayaker. Right. Right, okay, I, I'll, I'll watch out for because I'll watch but to the Olympics. Well, I've, there's never been an Olympian in our family before, so we're, <laughs> we're very happy. Aye. <laughs> right, so I'd like to thank Steve um, for these two excellent talks. Everyone has really enjoyed them both, and my mind has certainly been expanded and boggled in equal measures as I'm sure everyone's has tonight. So let's thank Steve in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.